Before we get into the show, let's just say thank you to all of our sponsors. 3B Construction and Roofing, Your Choice Healthcare, Lori's Dive In, DPF Alternatives, Nobles Networking, Project K9 Hero, special thank you to Mr. Jason Johnson, Cottonfield Grill, Pearl Promoting, Back, Road, Park, and Event Venue. We have a big show coming up there. Veterans Day weekend, so you guys be on the lookout for it now. Cashman's Pub, Down Yonder Hat Co., Deep South Chemicals, Better Than Basic Consulting, Miss Erica. Go check out our new website that they just did. It looks awesome for all your merch and all your Josh Terry information. It's thejoshterrypodcast.com. Now, let's see who's on the show today. Thank you all for tuning into the Josh Terry Podcast. Uh, once again, we're not at the studio because the air conditioner is broke, so we're at the house uh in our little makeshift studio that we had to set up yesterday um and today i'm excited to have this guest on uh my boys nikki t and uh matt burrell already had him on and uh let me tell you uh i've listened to this guy's music for a while uh, i'm gonna tell him a funny story about how he big leagued me at one point in time when i worked in radio he don't even know it's coming yet it's gonna be funny and <laughs> uh anyway i want to introduce you guys to uh mr sam grow what's up brother What's up, man? I'll tell you what, that's a good looking makeshift studio though. Uh dude, uh you've been to Red Door before, right? Oh yeah. Okay. So when I when we got our studio, this big commercial property down here in Georgia, I put nothing but red lights in it. It's nothing. I wanted to make it look like when the artists came in, they were walking into Red Door. So that's the cool. fact that there's even lights in here that aren't red are driving me nuts. Like, really? I'm, so, I'm so used to that red door vibe in the studio. And uh, uh, and everything, but uh, dude, I appreciate uh, you hanging out for a little bit, dude. Yeah, uh, yeah, man, happy to be here. I heard nothing but good things about you, and that you know, like in Nashville, that's not always how it happens. I try not to be an asshole, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's like um, one of, it's one we're... of my golden rules: just try not to be a dick. <laughs> like, dude, that's the that should be the rule of life, right there, man. Uh, yeah. And what I was talking about, you big leaguing me, so. You have a song, and I had to make sure I didn't mess this up. It's off of one of your older albums, um, and I tagged you in it. It's Love and Whiskey. It's, it's oh, love, shit. That Love and Whiskey album. Uh, when I was working in radio and that album came out, uh, like, I was bumping it at our station. Like, even though I, one of the reasons I got in trouble was for playing shit that, that like, is not from a music consultant. But, Here like, you go. So you know, got in trouble for being a good DJ. Yeah, that's right. What, that, that's yeah, you got like in trouble I, for. I knew what people that were listening to the show would want to hear. And I tagged you some stuff on uh, social media. And I remember thinking uh, when you read it, I was like, damn. I think I even sent you like a thing on Instagram. I was like, I want to get you on the, the show. We had a big radio show here in Georgia. And I was like, I want to get this dude on the show because he's cool as hell. Um, I, li I really like his music and everything and no response. So I always said, if I ever got the chance to say something to you, I was can gonna I give you a little shit about it, but I'm sure can, you get a million of those a day. Yeah. Well, can I tell you how me and my manager's relationship started? Yeah. He was a, a northeastern regional uh, PD at a radio station. Yeah. And one of the biggest. If he added you in full rotation, you would have a top 100 song on the country charts. Him as were two of the biggest ones up there, and he tried to call me and call me. <laughs> and call me and I wouldn't answer the phone. And, uh, he eventually ends up taking one of my songs and ripping it off of YouTube <laughs> and spinning it. And I charted. And then finally he got somebody to say, Hey, uh, and it actually wasn't even somebody. It was, uh, John Loba at BBR was like, Hey, do you know that you're charting on the country charts? Because this one radio guy is playing your, the shit out of your song. And I was like, no. And he goes, well, I have his number. You should probably, you know, maybe thank him or something. 
So I texted him and was just like, hey, man, I appreciate you. And then Brad was like, dude, do you not want to be on radio? And I was like, if I'm being honest, I, it's never been one of my goals ever. Yeah. And uh, and he goes, I tried calling you. And uh, he goes, you know, you didn't answer. And I was like, uh, and at the time, I, I was like, I thought you were a bill collector, uh, to be real, <laughs> real with you. And uh, And I was like, so, yeah, I didn't know. But we became buddies simply because I didn't. Like I wasn't about, you know, it like you get paid, you were in radio, you're in radio. So like you got patronized by so many artists in hopes that they would play. And man, I just can't be fake. I can't, I, it's not in me. It's never been something that I can do for my own beneficial, like things. I can't pretend to be your friend in hopes that you will do something for me. And, uh, that's the one thing that I just always can never get down with in radio. I know why. The boys from Ray's Rowdy said me and you were going to get along now. Uh, I'm 100% that way, dude. I can't kiss ass. And also, I think oh. that it, I think if you start being that way, then you have to continually be, like, non-genuine. And I can't do it. Like, a, as a younger man, before I came to my own, I'll be 36 next week. Uh, probably till like, 28, 29 years old, I did what everybody else always wanted me to. I was a fucking doormat, man. And – I've just made the decision in the past several years of my life. Like I'm going to live life my way. I'm going to make myself happy. And if that pisses somebody else off, then the hell with them. They shouldn't have been in my circle anyway, or supporting me. And yeah. Dude, it's weird. Don't, and it's just like, and me and Brad became buddies because as he continued in radio, when he'd come down for CRS, he'd be like, Hey, uh, you want to come on the show and do an interview? And I'm like, no, but when you're tired of getting everybody, you know, around you kissing your ass and you just want to come have a drink by a fire, I'll come pick you up. So it became a tradition every year he came down to Tennessee, I would just go scoop him up from CRS and he'd come over to my house and we would just hang out and drink. And then, I mean, it's no secret what is happening to radio. And so when it started to like go in a weird position, my label was trying to get me to sign to like the bigger league managements, which again, I'm just not a fan of because, and it's a good thing, but like if you're choosing, if your phone's ringing and it's for Brantley Gilbert or your phone's ringing and it's for me, I sure as hope as hell hope you're picking up the phone faster for Brantley Gilbert than you are me. So, you know, so it's like, I like the mom and pop relationships. Yeah, man. And I guess it's just the small town in me, but like I saw, so I called Brad and I was like, Hey, uh, do you like radio anymore? Because he was like you, he'd like to find. And honestly, I think the majority of radio people are like you and Brad. And if the corporate part of it left you guys alone, radio would have been thriving still what? because they took the person, like the personal piece out of radio when they got to a place where they shackled you guys from doing what you like to do, which is find artists, discover music and let listeners find artists and discover music through you. And they stole that from you, which I think is what made radio so lame yeah. now is we know, who, no offense to Luke. I love Luke Combs, but we already know Luke Combs. Why in your 40 slots do you have to fill seven of them? with Luke Combs songs, like just put the number one out there that he's got and then let some other people that are in discovery be in discovery. Well, what blew my mind, dude, is like, and I'm sure every DJ has this, like you have a text line, request line or whatever. And the request line never, ever matched up with what, what the program director or not really the program director. We had a cool ass program director where I was at, but the music consultant that told the program director what to put in there like to put in the log. What blew my mind was when Tyler Childers had the number one album on iTunes and everything with Creaker. And there's not a single Tyler Childers song or whatever, but everything that everybody wanted to hear when that blew up, because you you know, like I do, when somebody has a song blow up, they don't just usually listen to that one song. They'll go listen mm -hmm. to the whole category, like their whole catalog. And mm -hmm. Dude, I remember people wanting to hear whatever was the single off of that, but then Lady May must have been requested a million times. And it's just like, why aren't we playing this stuff? 
Uh, I had uh, old Larry Fleet on the show uh, at one point in time when where where I find God first came out like in 2019, 2020, and I played that song one time, and every show that I did after that, there were people that requested that song, but we would get in trouble for playing shit like that. Same same thing with your stuff, man, or anybody else that I thought was a good artist. It was always crazy that if I played a Sam Grove song, the next day people would be like, hey, can I hear this again? And you'd have some asshole in the front office being like, oh, you can't do this. But the listeners, like you're supposed to make the listeners happy, and you're just feeding them the same generic bullshit. That's why terrestrial radio is dead, because of a phone, yeah. because of whatever, to where you can play what you want to when you want to. If you're not giving the fans something new to listen to, they're going to run away. Yeah, well, that's what made it, you know, because even when it went from terrestrial to XM being more popular, yeah. XM at the time got more popular because you had the John Marks there at the time pushing the highway fines where people were going to listen to music and Spotify wasn't as, as accessible then, you know, and it definitely wasn't as advanced as it is now. But like having that discovery is such a big part of you know listeners a lot of people are you know into finding the new music they they still obviously love to listen to you know what is extremely popular but they're still wanting to hear the new stuff because i mean you when you're riding in your car which is also why i think all the time it's kind of silly for artists to be competitive with each other because when you're sitting in a car and you're riding for five or six hours, there's no way you're just listening to one artist for six right. hours. And, uh, and uh, it's the same thing with, with radio. Like how many times can you listen to those 40 songs, you know, before you're like, okay, this is the same thing. Yeah. See, I've even got a theory on that, dude. I think like the Luke Combs of this world would always have a number one. The Eric churches are always going to have a number one Riley green, uh, there's a couple more. Um, Ashley McBride ought to always have a fucking number one. Yeah, God, she's great. Yeah, uh, people like that that are super talented. I know I'm gonna leave some people out, and somebody's gonna give me some shit about it. But <laughs> there are certain people that are so talented that always should have a number one when it hits radio. There's a couple of folks, and I'm not gonna call their names. That if it wasn't for some music consultant pushing their shit, I don't think we'd even know who they were, and they damn sure wouldn't be in the top twenty, the top ten. There's some of that stuff that we're force fed. And next thing you know, because you're force fed it so many times, it's something in the background. And it's not even anything you really like. It's just background noise. Yeah. And I mean, and they'll get number one songs out of it. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately for them, I think of the, you know, being an artist, I think of an artist standpoint. I think when those companies do what they can to work a song up to radio too. A lot of those artists think, oh, hell yeah, I got a number one song in country radio. Then they go and play a club that holds 800 people and eight people show up and they realize that all the shit that they got fed in this town was all lies. Yeah. Just because you have the number one on radio doesn't mean you're going to sell the 800 tickets. And those that's always the saddest moments for me, man, is watching those artists come to the realization that the machine that they've been fed this whole time that they've been in town, all the ass they kissed, all the things they did, it doesn't matter. You know, like it wasn't, it wasn't worth it. Yeah. I think that you'll see that when you do our show, uh, the Josh Terry honky tonk night show, uh, September the 22nd, you'll have people that are there just to party and have a good time with you and all this kind of shit. We we've had people with other shows, and maybe they were at the Hummingbird. Maybe they wasn't. I'm not going to call nobody out. But they think they're hot shit. And they get there and they've got 10 people. And it's just Ooh. like, how? Do you realize that this doesn't translate? Like, this this doesn't match up. I don't care if you have a million something followers on TikTok. This doesn't match up. And if you don't understand that there are people like me and you, and especially the average everyday listener, not obsessive people like me that just love country music to my core, but like we know what's good and we know what's bad. We know what we want to pay a ticket price to go see and listen to. That's why I was excited to see that you were going to, that we were doing a show with you is like, I would pay a ticket to go see you. There's other people that have a huge 
social media following. And it's just like, I'm not paying, I'm not paying $10. I'm not driving an hour and paying $10 for this shit. I want to hear country music. Man. And honestly, the, what that social media has done to the industry is uh, honestly, I mean, some good has come out of it. I won't say all of it because there is some kids that blow up on TikTok from yeah. singing their garage. And I'm like, holy shit, this was amazing. But there is other ones where it's not, you know, it's fabricated. Oh, and then dude. a label will jump on them because of fabricated views. But I always tell people if they got a million followers on TikTok and then you go over to their Spotify and they have 20,000 listeners, something is wrong. Yeah. You know, and I'm proud to say I got 18,000 followers on TikTok, but I have 1.2 million monthly listeners. I'd much rather people want to listen to my music than look at my face. And I'm I'm OK with that. You know, yeah, like be. Well, that's that's what I want. I always credit my boy Trey Lewis. Um, oh, I love Trey, man. Trey, Trey and me are close. Like he's he's one of the oh. he's one of the people that already had paid his dues that already had the talent. And TikTok just exploded it and exposed everybody to his talent. Priscilla yeah. Blocks the same way. I'm not yep. real. I'm not real close with her, but she's real close with some of my real good friends. And she was talented before TikTok. Hannah yep. Dasher. There's a couple yeah. of them that are were really really talented before, and it exposed the world to them. Now you got some folks that are just like, oh, I'm gonna get a million followers, and now I decide I want to write songs and do country music. And it's like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? Like, it's it's, it's disheartening on some, you know. Like, yeah. for for those stories, like Trey and Priscilla, they were God. They grinded it out, man, and and worked and played a bunch of shows. And I will say, I tell people, I think that's why they're still successful oh, because yeah. Trey didn't pop off a song and then have nothing after that song. Yeah. He had catalogs of songs that were great because he's a great songwriter to put out. And he'd already put in work and playing shows. So that's why I sustained Priscilla the same way. She's a monster, like put the, had the one song, but had about 10 other ones right behind it to, to run up after that one was done or so people could discover ever. And, and what I found too is that a Spotify uh, fact is people who are now hearing songs on TikTok that are blowing up, they're going over to Spotify and 64% of them aren't even listening to that song that's blowing up on TikTok. They're going back in the catalog. So if you have nothing to offer in your catalog, you're going to lose all those people and all those listeners because they've already heard that 30 second piece of that song that is viral 9,000 times and they don't want to listen to it anymore. Absolutely. I've always had a problem with it. Too. I like the dudes that pay their dues. I'm all about paying your dues because I think that has everlasting staying power. I think oh, yeah. That, I think that is how you can – I've seen people, probably the same way you have, man, that have come from the social media world, and it's like they don't get but 10,000 views on a song, and they've got a million followers, and they think the world is ending. Me and you have been in situations where you release something, and you're happy to have 10,000 listens or views on it, right? Oh, yeah. And, like, they are so – it has to blow up everything they do where they're so discouraged that they don't want to do it. Somebody that has paid their dues and grinded and been on the other side of it, you're like, man, you ought to be grateful for what the fuck you got. Like, you're lucky to even have this. Like, you have a different mentality if you grinded and you played the smoky bars and you've done the – played the shit for shit money just to get your name out there and play at certain places. These other folks, man, they think if they're not playing Whiskey Jam that they're a failure, and there's not many people that get to play Whiskey Jam. Yeah, and, man, the what I don't like that it does is for new artists, which I, I'm lucky enough to get to work with and write with, it ruins their mentality Yeah, to where they think that if the first single they put out, like you said, doesn't get monstrous hits, that their career's over. And I'm like – dude, you put this song out and there's going to be a slow burn. Then six weeks from now, put another song out. Six weeks from then, put another song. Like, you have to let it build. Just because you aren't getting millions of streams day one is not anything. Your art is your art, and you're going to find your listeners. And, 
you know, my song, I have a song, The Blame, that came out in 2017. This past year, The Blame has done more streams in my career since it came out in 2017 than it did when it came out in 2017. Yeah. So it's like, just because a song is not exploding on the front end doesn't mean that it's not a song that's going to resonate with people. It's just, unfortunately, that's what's happening to a lot of the younger artists. And I feel bad for a lot of them, man. Like, a lot of them think... Be because they can't get a viral video they'll never get a deal uh because you know their songs are popping off they should just quit and go back home to their small town and i it just changed it changed so much for like the up-and-comers and and i hate that because there's a ton of talented up-and-comers that think that it's just not possible anymore one of my good buddies uh is brian martin do you know him yeah all right so me me and brian are up close and uh, we were sitting at a bar a couple months ago, and we were bullshitting. And he showed me his Spotify chart from when he first put a song out until whatever song he blew up with on social media. I think it was Beauty and the Struggle or something like that. Yeah. Like, he shows the chart. It is flatlined. And it, there's 20-something songs that he's probably released by then. If It's flatlined. But then when it took off, it's Mount Everest on everything that he does every single month, but he like he never stopped. And like once they once people, all it is is there are so many talented artists out there that you can't be exposed to all of them until you're exposed to a new one. And sometimes it's just by dumb luck that you get exposed to a new one. Uh, I'm a huge Brett Shiroki fan, and to, oh, you've got to be kidding me, Brett. I don't, Brett's been on the show, dude. I love Brett Shirok. Oh, man. I just talked to him yesterday, and I'm a massive Brett Shiroki fan, yeah. too. Like, it's serendipitous that you're saying that. Like, that's yeah. insane. I, he, yeah. He, he's one of those that when the world hears four, uh, four good years, when people hear four good years from him or they hear the uh, good thing going, they he he's going to blow up ridiculously. It's not his fault that he's not great at social media or all you'd have to do is go listen to him in one rider's rent and you're fucking hooked. And he, I mean, he's, yes. he's still grinding he's still going, but that's what everybody has to. And these younger kids that are just like, Oh, we want it now, man. They're going to, they're going to do one or two things, not have success and fall the fuck off where people like you, Brett, other people are just going to, it just takes the right thing the right platform, the right moment. And then because your catalog is so extensive and so good, they're going to be like, why the fuck wasn't I listening to Sam grow yeah. two years ago? Dude, I just shared him on my Instagram and I was sitting there going through like, okay, what song could I share to people for them to hear? And then I literally just said, I ended up saying, and just sharing his whole profile. Yeah. I was like, I tried one, but I can't. You should just go listen to all of them. Just go listen to all of his songs. Yeah. If you can listen through his top five and not tell me he is one of the best freaking song and can't tell me that he's not one of the best freaking songwriters and singers the town has to offer, then you don't have good ears. Like he's just so talented and his songwriting skills, man, are insane. Dude, he's one of those that when I get in the truck with people that like, I, I still live in Georgia. I'm just in Nashville once a month to record shows. So, like, when I get in the truck to go ride dirt roads or I'm going to a show around here and I'm taking friends with me, he's one of the first artists that I play. And I'm like, you guys are going to love this. Like, by the time you get done listening to it. Uh, I've got a lot of my friends have been divorced. I, just, yeah. I don't know why. But so I always play them that this ain't your place song oh, by him. So good. And it's like, if you don't like this, you don't have heart and soul and you need to get the fuck out of my truck now because we don't need to listen to music no more together. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. If you're a surface level listener, you ain't the kind of listener that I am. I can't, but, hang, and, can't hang out with him. Yeah, exactly. His, his whole catalog is incredible, man. I, and I, God bless you for championing him because uh, he needs it. And... I, I literally, that was my phone conversation with him yesterday was, you know, it's sad to me that in his career and especially with his writing skill that, you know, other labels look at him and feel like he needs to have better TikTok numbers and yeah. better 
And I was like, they're only listening with their eyes, man. I'm telling you, they're not listening with their ears. And when they do, your whole game is going to change. And I said, and it's not having the sustainability that it had before. And this isn't 2020 anymore where everybody is just living off of the 10 second clips. Yeah. We're back into life. And eventually they're going to start being able to listen to you with their ears. And that's when it's all going to change. And it's just God. He's so talented. And man, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that you're, you're championing them too, man. It makes me super happy. Well, dude, I like storytelling and I like, it doesn't matter. Like I'm a diehard country fan, but even if it's a, a pop song or something like, like if there's a good story behind it, I, I'll tell you some bullshit right here that I've never told anybody else. I saw the Miley Cyrus meme or whatever, where she talks about the song that she wrote. I think this flower song that came out last and the video where she's wearing like her ex-husband's suit that cheated on her and all this type of shit. That's a fucking banger to me. Like, oh, it's, a, it's an amazing story. Like it really yeah. is. So when people and you too, you can write a fucking story. So like, Thanks. there's a lot of your songs. I know we're sitting here talking about Brett and other storytellers, but you're you're the same way, dude. It's where I can put you on, and I want to listen to you going through whatever you're going through at the time. And a lot of artists, they, they especially this newer generation, they want to sit there and they want to just write what they think is going to get spins or plays, but it doesn't – you can't listen to it in 10 years. I'm all about legacy. I like to be around the people – that it might take them a little bit longer to get started or pay their dues or whatever, but they're eventually going to write something that in 10 years from now we're going to listen to and we're going to be like, this is still just as good today as it was 10 years ago. And I think folks like you and Brett and some more artists that we've had on the show recently, I mean, hell, we had your, uh, I don't think it's label mate, but you got the same manager, Jason Michael Carroll on two weeks ago. And he still, there's still people that cried when he played at my show last or two weeks ago for a list of lies. Oh, I, yeah, man. I love that shit. But and he wrote it by himself. He's writing it so good. Yeah. And he wrote it by himself, dude. Like yeah. when, when you think about that, uh, I was lucky enough, man. The, the last three single, the last three cuts he did, I got to produce it. So oh, that's awesome, dude. Oh, bro. And if I, could tell you i'm so glad that the talk back mic only works one way because he would start to sing something and then i'd go hey man i'd hit a talk back and i go hey man uh can you sing that line how you just did it and i'd let go and i'd look over my engineer and i'd be like bro i just got to tell jason michael carroll to sing a line <laughs> like dude you don't understand and he me and him were both freaking out just because we were like holy shit like this is this is our guy, you know, that early two thousands, man, that that's my fucking childhood, you know, like, yeah, I got to tell him, uh, he's got a song called let me go. And yeah. I went through that same shit. And I remember being, I graduated in like 2006. So it probably would have came around out in the next year or two after that. So I was like 20, 21 years old. I lived that fucking song. And I remember like, there's something special about when an artist puts out a song, that is so relatable to you. And Jason's always been that for me. Yeah, he's a great songwriter, man. Real and honestly, one of the best singers. I'd have him sing another verse just so I could hear him sing it again. Not because it was bad. I could take the one time he sang it and make it, but just so I could hear him sing it again. Like, he's just an amazing singer and honestly, a sweet dude and, and been through a ton of things and, uh, I just love it when you get to meet people like that and that had an impact, you know, on your life and they're just warm hearted, you know? Yeah. That's the problem too, with these social media folks. And I'll call them out right now. Is <laughs> I've been let down so many times by having someone on the show just because they have a big social media presence. Like it's clickbait. You hope they're going to be a good person but you realize like this person has their head so far up their ass. Like they're, they're just, they don't understand what reality is. People like you that have had to grind to get to where you are and work your ass off. And for people like me, that's the same way. It's almost disrespectful 
in a way that I can't describe it to anybody else. When somebody walks into a room, um, I'm sure you know Bobby Pinson. Uh, yeah, I, I, Bobby's Bobby's one of my dudes. I love Bobby. Oh Pinson man, so lucky fun. you. So fucking <laughs> much. Tell him if he ever wants to write a song with me, I would be honored. <laughs> hey, he he he's at all of our shows. Like Bobby just played the last one. Him and Jason Michael Carroll was the last round that we played oh, that we did at Live Oak the other day. Bob, oh Bobby, my god, I love Bobby. Uh, but like I've been in rooms where you'll get somebody that thinks they're a social media celebrity or whatever. They'll walk in the room and they'll not know who Bobby is. Or they'll not know who we've been sitting at a table with Dallas Davidson before. And they don't, they'll come over and they'll speak to the TikToker, but they don't even realize what the fuck is sitting in front of them. And that that's where I have a huge problem with these people. It's like if it wasn't for the songwriters anyway, there wouldn't be songs in my like there just wouldn't be. There'll be poppy bullshit. It it takes special people. And when you have got your head so far up your ass or so far into TikTok that you don't think that you think that you're more important than those songwriters over in the corner, man, it, I have a fucking issue with it. Oh, dude, me too. I mean, one of my closest friends, he was my first co writer I ever had in town, is Steve Bogard. And I mean, president of NSAI, he wrote Carrying Your Love with Me for George Strait and a bunch of other number one songs that are massive to our genre. But uh, I've had it happen several times where, like, I'm in the room with a younger, you know, artist or track guy. And then I'm also there with Steve. And they have no idea who he is. <laughs> and they just seem very unimpressed. And then I'm like, man, you should go you wish you could have half of his career. I promise you. Not to mention his talent is unbelievable. And it's sad. I, I just it's I feel like the more pressing that the social media gets on the town, the more it is making Nashville like high school yeah. and less like college. And when I got here, I was, I got to Nashville in 2014. And when you got to get in those rooms with those writers, you got to go to school, you know, like they taught you, they helped you craft a story. They helped you understand, you know, the craft of songwriting. And uh, like, that's, that's, what's missing now is now it's more it's more me and less uh you know us and let me learn while i'm here you know yeah so last year uh, i made an ass out of myself um we played in the past two years played in the creative vets golf tournament out at old hickory um for all of y'all don't know what creative vets is please go look them up it's an amazing organization in mm -hmm. and um I'm sitting there and like one of the guys with creative vets introducing me to people and telling them what I do and all this kind of shit and everything. And, uh, they introduced me to Aaron Lewis and I about, I had like one of my first fangirl moments and I try not to be that way, but yeah. I grew up on fucking stained anyway. Yeah. Like it's been a while. It's always going to be my favorite fucking rock song ever. Um, but sitting next to him, was um Dan um I always fuck up his last name. It's Dan Tremendous. Huff. Oh, yeah. Tremendous. Yeah. Oh, I Hell didn't yeah. know. I didn't know who the fuck he was. I I just yeah. it was just one of those things. I didn't know who he was. And man, when as soon as I got up and walked away from him, one of my buddies that was standing there with me, they were like, "Do you know who that was?" And I was like, "No, who? I mean, his name's Dan." And he's like, "Just go look up what all he's doing." And I felt like I was an inch fucking tall. And it, it just, ugh, it made me sick to my stomach. And that's when I started really trying to dive into more, you know, you don't have to be flashy. You ain't got to be the loudest person in the room. You, you you don't know who the hell you're talking to. Yeah. I mean, dude, Union Station, I spent the majority of my youth in Winfield, Kansas. And, uh, uh, Walnut Valley Bluegrass Festival is one of the biggest bluegrass festivals there is. And when I was a kid, Allison Krauss, I mean, I, when I said kid, I was like six or seven. And my dad was friends with Kevin Green, who ran the festival at the time. God rest his soul. But 
uh, he took me there and I got to stand backstage and watch Allison Krauss and Union Station and John McCutcheon. And it that's what made me love bluegrass and country music and the storytelling and the performance. Like, you know, because bluegrass is that stripped vibe, one mic and storytelling. And I just yeah. love it. And man, he's he's the shit. Dan's yeah. amazing. I just got to play the Opry with Ricky Skaggs, and that oh, was like one of the wildest moments for me too. Just I was too nervous to say hi. My guitar player, who's a massive fan, he said hi. But like even that was just like holy shit, it's Ricky Skaggs, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I I love Ricky. See, I'm a like Keith Whitley's my all time favorite. Oh yeah, dude. Yeah, I got a Kentucky Bluebird tattooed on my forearm playing a guitar for Whitley, and then I got the possum right above it. But That's like, like, there's something about bluegrass anyway that I think it's where there's so much of my love for country music came from bluegrass, and it's it's people like Ricky that has just been doing like when somebody tells me that the younger generation doesn't know who Ricky Skaggs is or never heard a bluegrass song, it discourages me so bad. It makes me think, oh, we're fucked. Like we're this next generation is just so screwed because I can still hear bluegrass to this day and it hits me in a way that nothing else ever can. Yeah, man. And what is sad is what they don't realize is they probably know more about bluegrass than they think. Yeah. Like without the steel drivers, we don't have Chris Stapleton. Ooh, yes, sir. So just dig dig back just one step back and you'll get to find you know, some even cooler stuff from them. But that's what I'm saying. Like it sometimes it just makes it more surface than it does in depth with, which makes me a little sad, but you know, I think that eventually, you know, there's a hope that there's some kids that will start doing the deep diving and change the trend because I mean, even uh, the generation below the one currently uh, like my daughter, she loves Fleetwood Mac. She yeah. loves Deftones. She loves Tool. And I'm like, holy shit, like those are some, that's some deep cuts, man. Like, you know, like that's some deep stuff to find. And so they are digging through on Spotify, mainly because of the like suggestion. If you listen to this, then you should listen to this. And they do it. So I hope that there's more of that coming along, you know? My, my daughter surprised the shit out of me the other day. Uh, my daughter will be 12 in September. Or That's 12 awesome. This, 12 this month. And uh, we were cleaning the house or whatever, and Gracie, dude, she's so hooked on Hardy, and I love – I like Hardy just as much as anybody else. Now, I, I do. Gracie yeah. only listens to Hardy. Like, not even walling that much. Really <laughs> just fucking Hardy, right? And all of a sudden, I hear Pony Bradshaw – coming out of the kitchen. I don't know if you're familiar with Pony Bradshaw. They got a song called Van Gogh that is oh. fucking so good. And my daughter, I'm like, how the fuck is she in here listening to this? It surprised me. But, like, I think uh, us as dads, though, if we play the music that we grew up loving and what was passed down to us, hopefully our kids keep putting it out there into the world and they're not just listening to what they're force-fed. Yeah, and there is an authenticity that's starting to happen in the genre too that I think kids are gravitating towards, you know. And I and people think that the Oliver Oliver Anthony thing is a phenomenon, but I was like, no, mm -hmm. it's what it should have been, and yeah. the reason why, and it hasn't been that for years. So finally, a guy who is writing real shit, the day that he puts it out, it explodes. Well, it's because everything else has been, you know pushed down that had real and a lyric. So now finally, when someone gets a real lyric out there in front of the world, it exploded, of course, because that's what people want to hear. They want to hear a real lyric, not surface, you know, bops that come out on for 30 seconds on a TikTok video, you know? Yeah, I think, uh, I know I've got some buddies that aren't the biggest fan of him because I, I don't know why I love his shit. I, I, I like do. the whole Appalachian everything he put out a song yesterday or i saw it for the first time yesterday and it's called uh 70 chevy or some shit um okay. but it's it's really really good i think with him it was the right song at the right time by the right dude 
And it was just all these things that just people are so sick and tired of the way that we're force fed bullshit from our government, from the media, by all this kind of stuff to where when he hit, it was an anthem. Like you don't really get like an anthem very much. I thought this, stu- I, and I, I, Jason Aldean's from like 45 minutes from where I'm from. The one that he put out wasn't even about what they tried to make it to be. So it could nah. never have been an anthem. Like to yeah. us, it was not. But this is a fucking anthem for you, for me, for e- even like I'm not a conservative. I'm not a liberal. I am an independent. I believe that you're supposed to make yourself and your family happy regardless of anything else. Like the government's not going to tell me how to make myself happy. Yeah. And this, that's what that song is. And it's, and I think that's why it just resonates so much with everybody. Yeah, man, I'm the same way. I'm, you know, a lot of people sacrifice their lives, uh, to make this country free. So I feel like you should be able to be free to do whatever you, you know, you want to do. And, I definitely don't get down on my knees and pray to an old white dude in the president's office. I pray to God. He's that's my first choice. Everything else, everything else, you know? Well, you can tell it in your music too, though, Sam, like you've got a couple of songs that I I would imagine you even might've called a little shit for, but oh, dude. And the bad part is, is the stereotyping that I get just because I'm a country dude. Yeah. you know, sings country music that because I make a statement about loving my country, all of a sudden I'm a lot of things that I never yeah. said in the song that I was. And it it's, you know, it comes with part of the territory, I think. But, yeah, I, I think that I try to correct it as much as I can. It's like, man, I, I, and even in my way I'm living song, I'm like, yo, if you are a uh, city guy and you build up city businesses and you don't know shit about my side of the fence that's fine you live that way but don't intrude on my space and i'm not gonna intrude on yours and you just you know we'll keep it keep it moving you know because lucky for us there was people out there that signed their name on the dotted line to go fight for this country and our freedom we're blessed enough to have them and we got that freedom because of them and so we should enjoy it, you know? <laughs> yeah, we work with a lot of mental health organizations for veterans. And awesome. I, I have yet to hear a single vet out of the hundreds and hundreds that we've been around say, oh, I just fought for this person or I just fought for this belief. No, it's always I fought for your right to believe whatever you want to believe as long as you don't harm anyone else. They they don't care. Even when everybody was doing the kneeling for the flag bullshit, like there were vets that I know that was like, I'm not mad about it. And I would, I would be like the one that was like, how are you not mad at this? And they would all tell me the same thing. They're like, look, I fought for this country to be free. If somebody, if that's the way they want to protest or they want to demonstrate, I help give them that right. I'm not the happiest about it, but I'm not going to go up in arms against them because they we live in a free place yeah and i i had to i had a lot of conversations like that too because i was definitely one of the ones that were pissed about it and i was very open about it and wrote a song about it it's my number one (laughs) but like you know i i got the same conversations where they said you know they think that they are disrespecting a military person by kneeling but in reality they're still respecting me because they wouldn't have the freedom to do that if i didn't go and fight for it and i never looked at it at that perspective and of course when i did that writing i was you know young and fucking pissed so and full of vinegar so i (laughs) I just did what i needed to do and i as i get older i'm wanting to learn and understand you know both sides of the fence but like it uh it definitely, and man, it's true. I just hope that anybody who ever did kneel on the flag didn't do it out of disrespect for someone who gave them the freedom yeah. to do it. And I think some of it portrayed it that way, which is why I was so upset because I've done plenty of things with, you know, 22 kill where I've watched guys that have been blown up over there and have no, you know, legs, all metal. And when I talk to them about it and they'd say, they literally say they'd go back again for me. Like if they called them today, they would go back and fight again for me. And I'm like, man, the kind of heart that takes and 
the kind of love that takes for someone that you don't even know, you know, to want to go and fight for a bigger purpose and cause it's the most selfless thing that a person can do. I'm glad you get it. I, I, I love seeing how passionate you are about it. You just, you, if I already didn't like you, you would have just won me over right then. I I have to tell people all the time because we work with a lot of the big social media personalities, right? And like I just took some down to Mission Twenty Two uh, to Fort Stewart for a benefit ride. Uh, we go to all the creative vet stuff in Nashville. Um, once you meet these guys and you see what they are and you hear what they've been through and how they still have this warrior's mentality but a heart of gold. Like, how could you not want to rally yourself, your friends, everybody around these men and women and just do everything you can for them? I don't – I don't – I cannot stand when I see some of these folks and they are just so selfful or whatever it is. They're just – they're, they're such crybabies and they only think about themselves to where, man, they don't even give a shit about why you're being able to do what you want to do. And it drives me fucking nuts, dude. Yeah. it Honestly, man, it, I, I, I was fortunate enough to have, I mean, my two best friends that I had through middle school and high school, the day I graduated, both of them signed up for the Marine Corps the day I graduated uh, one of them is still around and the other one succumbed to PTSD. And uh, it was a blessing and the most heartbreaking thing that I could ever experienced. But I tell people even now, even him being my best friend, I I still couldn't relate to the things that he had to see and do. And even people who watch the shit in the movies or watch on, you still can't relate because you aren't that had to sit behind the gun and pull the trigger on any of that stuff. And it's not a human, a natural human response to have to do some of the shit that they had to do over there. And to not treat it with the most extreme sensitivity is mind blowing to me. So sometimes I have to calm myself down on some of that stuff, but it's because it's so touchy and personal. And I think it's because a lot of these people just don't have anybody in their corner saying, Hey, this is what they did. And I know to you, that just sounds like someone telling stories, but that shit is real. They really had to shoot a kid that had a bomb strapped to him because people over there don't give a fuck. They will walk over. They are down to sacrifice their kids to take out an American soldier. They don't give a fuck. They don't care. So you have a choice. It's either them or you. And they're putting 18 year old kids in those positions. My daughter, I had her when I was 20. She's 15 years old. Three years from now is how old John was when he went over to Afghanistan. My buddy, John, like, he hadn't even had his, you know, first legal drink, you know, and he had to go over there and do that. And to think about that. And that's why just any dudes that have gone through that and are still here. I'm like, what a fucking champion, man. Those are the people that we should, you know, roll out the red carpet for, not the people that, that we roll the red carpet out for now. You know, those military men and women should be. be just extremely celebrated and kids they just i i hope that somehow there's a change in that you know even like how they treated vietnam vets you know like when they came back they got spit on and trash thrown at them and you know now and even still there's they're still proud to wear their vietnam uh veteran hats and i'm just like man what a fucking you think this other shit is tough that shit right there is tough dude you know, that puts on his hat even after all of his, you know, men and women that joined him in those fights got treated like absolute shit. He still puts his hat on because he's still proud of it. That's a that's a badass. This that's other shit, that's a that's not bad. That dude is badass, you know, like and I just 
it's we get so caught up in all the other stuff and you know especially in our music's like outlaw this and outlaw that i'm like bitch you aren't an outlaw like yeah. those, those guys are for real gunslingers for real you know badasses you sing songs you know the, we sing songs, and that's myself included yeah. <laughs> Dude, i get i'm the same I, one you know yeah uh i love hanging out with songwriters because you just wrote a song like that right there he still puts his hat on yeah yeah oh dude hey yeah that's good we yeah. all right to- yeah we can uh you already said something earlier i took a note down i was gonna text you when we got done um, there you go. yeah because I, I write with some folks i ain't at your level by any means <laughs> but, uh, but no that's a, that's a fucking I'm- song right here <laughs> yeah we should do that and i gotta send you because on this album i have uh a song it took me a long time to write it i'd always had this title in my phone and uh since i lost john and it just took me a long time to get to a place where i felt like i was in a room where i could trust the people i was with yeah. and we could write it um but i'll send it to you it's called uh ain't gotta fight no more oh, and yeah, absolutely and uh it, it's about john and it just uh it took me a while to get there but it's it's one of my I think it's one of those songs where I know I moved here for that reason, you know, to, to write that. Well, I think everybody, uh, I, I used to say this a lot when we first started the show. Um, I think everybody has one, at least one great song in them, one all time song, because nobody else can tell the story of your life, but you, nobody That's- else can tell what you've been through, but you. And when you've gone through trauma, tribulations, lost friends, lost family, uh, raising daughters like we are like you're you're gonna have those moments to where something's gonna happen and if you're talented and you're obviously extremely talented you're Thanks, gonna bro. have a moment to where this is why I was supposed to be doing this 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 song right here this moment right here is why I knew I was gonna be a musician and so I'm, I'm excited to hear it dude man I'm excited to send it to you I got to I got to play it uh at the Opry and oh. That was one of the coolest things because, I mean, you know, the circle's forever, Man, you know? Yeah. So I got to play that there and tell John's story so he'll get to live there forever. And I know that that would have meant the world to him. And I was so thankful that I got the opportunity to do it, you know, and, and just let him have a little bit more of a legacy there. Yeah. The reason why I do shows like this, Sam, is because I, I didn't, I want people to hear all of this. I want people to hear what's behind the music and what a good person somebody is or whatever. Uh, me being told before we even started that you were cool as hell, like, and then listening to your music, you can tell that your music is a representation of you. Thanks, like it, brother. And that, and that is probably the best compliment that I can give an artist is what I hear and what I connect with. If it's actually the artist, like it, it just means more to me. If it's you know, we've we've all had to hear these songs about riding dirt roads and all this kind of shit. Then you go to the studio and it's some kid that pulls up in a BMW with white cowboy boots on, and it's just <laughs> and it's just like yeah. I don't believe this shit. But now after seeing you, and especially social media exposes everybody to who they really are. You're like I hate this even more now than I did before because it's not you. Is is it's definitely not you. But with you, everything that I've I've heard from you and everything that I've liked from you, just talking to you, has made me like it even more. It gives me more of a reason to listen to it because it is you. Thanks, brother. I appreciate it. And man, it's funny too because I think that you know I feel like I've had a couple kids come in and, and write at my house and you know when they talk about what they're driving or whatever and they want to write about a truck and then i look out in the driveway and they have a ford focus i'm like you know you can't write that and i won't write that with you and they're like why and i'm like because we live in the realest genre of music and there's a reason why i don't talk about shooting deer yeah. Because I climb up in a damn deer stand at five in the morning and shoot deer. I don't have I'm, the desire. I'm the same way. I don't fucking, I can't do it. But you ain't going to catch me singing about it because yeah. I don't 
they're going to be able to tell that I'm full of shit. If I'm yeah. singing about, di-. I was like, so if you can't admit that everything that you're saying in this song is bullshit, then you probably shouldn't sing it, you know? And I, like, I'll talk about ripping lips. I love to fish. One of my favorite things to do. I'll sing about fishing all day long, but I'm not going to sing about shooting deer. Just like you shouldn't sing about driving a truck when you have a four focus out in my driveway. And if you live in a, a apartment, downtown and you came from the city before you came to that apartment you shouldn't be singing about acreage like you know about acreage they're gonna know you don't know anything about acreage no you know yeah man i oh god touchy subject for me i grew up with a farm family like my like we didn't grow up on the farm but we grew up close to it but my whole family has been farmers since they over 60 70 years right and when you hear in certain songs, like somebody singing a happy song about farming, it's like, no, you didn't farm. Like I know, yeah. cause there's never been a happy day really on a farm except for when it was quitting out. Like that, yeah. that's it. Like don't sit here and tell me how happy you are to be a farmer in this day and age. I guess it, there's so much shit, even like riding dirt roads where I'm from is my favorite thing to do in the world. I'd rather go get a 12 pack of beer, ride dirt roads and ride around and listen to old country music than do anything. And when you hear some of this shit, you can tell right off the bat, you have never done this. Nothing wrong with the way you were raised. You're probably the way you raised was a lot better than me, to be honest with you. I love the way I was raised, but I talk and I, and I, I write and everything that I do about the way that I live. Well, I don't understand why everybody doesn't do that. Your life is good enough. Tell your story. Yeah. And I, what, most of the time happens in those situations when I write with those kids is they understand it's okay to just be honest. Yeah. I, I I mean, I have a buddy that's a friend of mine and he's always wanted a truck, doesn't have one, but I'm like, man, it would be better if you wrote that song about wanting the truck than having the truck and most of the time it it turns out to where they go man it just the like grace of of saying <laughs> that was my bulldog uh, <laughs> the grace of them saying you know or me saying like hey it's okay to be honest you know yeah i'll i'll send you one uh we'll have to exchange numbers when this is over i'll send you one that me and these two boys just wrote and it's called i ain't no cowboy um, oh yeah, and it's uh the hook on it is um I ain't never rode Red Rock. I'm a little more south of Rocky Top. Oh, I love I ain't it. no cowboy. Yeah, so Man. like that's that's what I mean. We're we it's like paying homage to them, but that, I think that's what everybody's supposed to do is you're supposed to write about what the hell you know. Yeah, for sure. And it's funny you got ain't no cowboy. I I wrote that uh, title too with uh, oh. Terry Terry McBride and Bryce Long. Two of probably the most cowboy writers ever, but I uh, I've written that one one before too. Uh, is it on one of your albums? No, it's not out. Oh. I'll send you the work tape though, oh, so you can yeah. hear. It. Um, yeah. well, real quick before we get off your books, I know you got other shit to do today, and we'll catch up. What uh, besides for you playing the hummingbird for us September the twenty second here in Macon, Georgia? What else do you got coming out, or what uh, what other events you got coming up? Yeah, so I'm playing the very next night uh, at Smith's Old Bar in Atlanta. Okay. Uh, so I'll be there the next night. And then I have singles coming out for the rest of the year at the end of the month, every month. And I have a full album dropping January 19th. Cool. You got anything between now and then they can find you as far as shows go? Uh, yeah. Well, they're, the two that I have before then are – uh, sold out though, which is oh, a good, okay. which is a good problem. But well, yeah, um, and then January through March, I do, I'm doing a massive uh, tour, an acoustic tour, which are my favorite to do, um, and we're calling that the Cigars and Bars tour. Uh, so we're gonna go out and hit the hit the road, and now I have plenty of places to see me. Well, cool, dude. Well, man, I appreciate it. I look forward to hanging out with you whenever you're down here in Georgia. Uh, I don't know if you play golf or anything like that, but we can get together earlier that day if y'all get in in time and uh, we can bullshit around before the show, have a couple drinks. Dude, I'd love to swing some clubs. Do you smoke cigars? Do I? Yeah. All right. 
got we got to do that then. But dude, y'all, you got to just tell me what they're down. I think when you come, especially because you're going to Atlanta the next day, I imagine yeah. you ain't got to leave right when the show's over. Nope. Uh, I will show you a good time in Macon, Georgia, before, after, and during. Dude, I'm pumped. I'm ready. Uh, any of them smoke lounges around there that you might want to suggest? Let's go hit one of those, man. I'm always down smoking. And I heard, is it true that the Hummerbird you can smoke in there? Yeah, yeah, you can smoke in there. Oh, let's Let go. me tell you, this place, <laughs> this place, I've done a lot of businesses with a lot of bars. Uh, Hummingbird came to me at the beginning of the year and said that they wanted to use my name and use some of my contacts or whatever. And I was like, only if I get to pick the artist, only if I get to have final say so on the artist. And because the place is so cool, it is such a unique vibe when you go in there and what Lisa Williams and everybody's done there has just really improved it over the past year doing these country nights. And man, it is, it's where you want to go to get hammered, but like the good hammered, not sad, but yeah. I want to throw down. I want to party. I want to run up a $200 beer tab. I want to smoke cigars or something else in there. Like it's, it's where you can have a fucking blast, dude. Well, I'm excited, dude. I'm pumped. I can't wait to hang with you and hang with the people making it's first time I've ever played making Georgia. So oh, yeah, they're going to love you. And the guy that's one of the, I know you got two openers, but yeah. the, one, the one that starts off Chucky P is a guy who back seven or eight years ago, he was the guy when I first started doing shows for anything, he was one of my guys and he is such a good time. And you are going to fucking love. He told me to tell you, Hey, cause he likes your music. And Dude, yeah. uh, he's looking forward to meeting you brother. Right back, right back at him, man. He's super kind online too. When he's sharing the show, I hit him back on a couple of those that he shared, but I'm excited to meet him and super excited to hear him play. So cool. we'll drop your social medias and we'll get out of here. Um, and uh yeah, you can get on with your day. Yeah, at Sam Grow Music, as long as it's got that blue check mark, don't fall for the other ones. <laughs> they aren't real. But yeah, at Sam Grow Music on everything. Well, cool, dude. All right, folks. Well, thank you, Sam, for hanging out. That's uh September the twenty second at the Hummingbird, Mr. Sam Grow, Josh Terry Honky Tonk Nights. It's gonna be a blast. So get your tickets now and get there early and have a good time with us. Uh That's right. Sam, I appreciate it, brother. Dude, I appreciate you, man. All right, folks, thank y'all for listening to the Josh Terry Podcast. I will catch y'all later.